today we talked about yet again the hot topic of humans mattering more than dogs and some specific scenarios in which we had clients that were in a situation where it was like, we don't have time to like worry about how can we make this as dog centered as possible and make it all about the dog Mm -hmm. and their experience. It's like, no, these people are uh, in danger around this yes. dog. These people are in in a situation where they're about to get evicted from their apartments or their homes because of this dog's behavior. Like, this needs to get fixed now. The human and dog experience, you mm-hmm. know? Mm-hmm. I want to talk about... I want to branch more off of when we talked to that like funny moment we had last time that they clipped where we were like, but what about if the dog is flooding us? Mm -hmm. What about us? What about us? And I want to hone in on any specific situations that you've encountered where truthfully the dog really doesn't matter so much in that moment because there are bigger things at stake involving the humans. So like Mm -hmm. we just need to get this under control immediately. We don't have time Mm -hmm. to play these games and do like this girl yesterday that I worked with, um, with that dog. Like she's been working with people for over a year. She still can't leave Mm -hmm. her apartment. Her dog just tried to attack another dog that lives in the apartment next to her. She is at risk of getting evicted and Mm -hmm. losing her home because of this. I don't have time Mm -mm. to be like, but how does the dog feel? Mm-hmm. How are they feeling the right now? Acting like a monster and danger to society to the point where somebody's living situation is being threatened. Yeah. We don't. We don't. We can't do that. I'm sorry. I know you guys <laughs> hate this, but humans come first. Like, yes. We've said it once. We'll say it a million times yeah. more until people get it through their brains. I had like that exact situation with a board and train we had recently that um, came to us and she was at risk of being kicked out of her apartment unless she did something with the dog. So the dog had to prove that it went to training and the dog has to wear a muzzle out because she lunged at somebody one time. And the dog's behavior was like insane when she first came to us, just just screaming, crying. And her mom was like, this dog is making me miserable. Mm Mm-hmm. Don't you think you should teach people how to enjoy their dogs and like the busy average person doesn't have time to like sit here with a bag of treats and be like, please stop doing that. No. And also she tried guys Mm -hmm. like with my client in this case, she did all the things. Trust me. Like I said last time, they've got her out here doing the damn cha-cha slide, the Cupid shuffle (laughs) with the leash this short and all the treats and all the snacks and all the management techniques and all this kind of stuff. And guess what? She still couldn't watch the freaking TV in her house Mm -hmm. because you turn on the TV, the dog's lunging and trying to attack Mm -hmm. it. She can't put the dog out on the porch because if anything goes by or she's anything, she's lunging and she's attacking from the Mm -hmm. porch. She can't go out of her apartment without the fear of her dog attacking another dog. Like, it was absolutely ridiculous. And you want to know what these trainers told her along the way she's working with them? One told her she needed to move. Legitimately told this woman that she needed to completely relocate to a different living situation. As if people these days, as if we can all just uproot our entire mm-hmm. lives and just move. Yeah. Right? And then somebody else told her that, oh, you may just never be able to take your dog on a walk around mm-hmm. your apartment complex. You that is insane. Can. Yeah. I think it's just like, it's almost harmful to like disregard the use of balance training and tools and training when done appropriately. Like, like the older clients that I told you that I had that their vet was like, don't take her to Miracle Canine because they use e collars and these people are like in their 80s and this dog has knocked them onto the ground before and is a safety issue. Yeah. So if going to Miracle Canine and receiving a damn good training helped this dog and we have to correct the dog when it pulls, guess Mm -hmm. what? The dog learns, oh, if I don't pull, I don't receive the correction. And the dog is as happy as a clam She gets to go for 10 times more walks because she's not pooling. Mm -hmm. So a lot of this is like selfish, like self-indulgent, like God 
it's like a god complex yes like yeah it really is it's like a they have like a savior complex where i'm just i just i get so annoyed when we post videos of of us working with these dogs and things like that that like all anyone ever has to say is something about the freaking dogs Mm -hmm. that's not why i'm a dog trainer yes i love animals I love working with dogs. I care very deeply about them. I, You cannot and you will not last or be any type of useful as a dog trainer if you don't care about people. Mm-hmm. I continue to train dogs and have trained dogs for over 10 years now because I care about the people mm-hmm. <laughs> that I'm working with. And so it's so frustrating to me to see the comments on video, like, Stevie, for instance, we she was in our last vlog and she's a younger dog that we're using. We were using a pet corrector with. Mm-hmm. Right. And we had a, a plastic prong on her and we were using a pet corrector and treats, mind you, when she earned them and we use them as rewards. But this dog was doing very uncharacteristic. These weren't puppy behaviors. Mm-hmm. OK, she may be a puppy. But the behavior she was exhibiting needed to be dealt with in the same way that I would deal with them with any other dog because they were dangerous. Mm -hmm. She was trying to chase cars. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You can't do that. And if you have to utilize a pet corrector in order to stop a behavior from escalating to the point of dangerous, like I'm absolutely going to do that. Yes. And I remember reading over those comments and somebody is like, her timing is terrible. No, it wasn't. It was actually very good timing. Thank you. Um, And... (laughs) It's just like, thanks, Bridget. Yeah, their lack of knowledge, like, and somebody commented on something of mine. They're like, you're, it's so painfully obvious how little experience you have. Is it? Because on the podcast, we get to be characters and you can see like little clips of reels that you can disagree with. And then you can create a weird parasocial relationship (laughs) and be like, this person sucks. (laughs) Fuck her. Yeah. And then you just get too angry. People really just, again, they they take it too deep. It's not that deep. It's a dog. Mm -hmm. It's not that deep. And you're improving the dog's life and the client is comfortable enough with the training and loves the training that they come back every week. And Mm -hmm. that's why we get really good reviews and we do really good business because we know what we're doing. I literally just had a new client start last night with a puppy, a German Shepherd puppy. It's their first dog that they've ever gotten. The whole family came. It was very fun. And he said at the beginning, I always ask how people hear about us and stuff. And he said at the beginning of the session, he's like, oh, well, I honestly was just looking on Google. He's like, and I happened upon your guys' Google page. And I was like, this looks too good to mm, be true. That's what people say to me all the time. I know. They're like, this looks too good to be true. How did they figure out how to delete mm-hmm. negative reviews? Like, this is crazy that mm-hmm. they have this many five-star reviews. And um, he was like, so obviously, like, we decided to come here because the client satisfaction rate is so high. Mm-hmm. And that's that's what's so frustrating is it's like we care so deeply about our clients and the dogs mm-hmm. that we work with. And you guys get to see snippets of it. Snippets, by the way, of sessions and us working with people ultimately in the grand scheme of things that drastically changes their lives and causes them to leave us these five-star reviews because of how happy they are with how productive our training program is. And yet you guys can still find something Mm-hmm. that to you nitpick. yeah to yeah. nitpick or disagree with or whatever it might be and again it's always about the dog the dog the dog the dog the dog i don't care sometimes <laughs> i care about <laughs> how do i make this dog stay in this home okay because again with this woman in this apartment complex we're at the we're at a point where this needs to get under control now immediately within the hour that I am at Mm. your house with you or else you are potentially either going to be homeless with your dog or you're going to have to send your dog off to a shelter because you can't afford to be homeless and and leave and find somewhere else to live. Pass a behavioral And I, exactly. That's not going to pass a behavioral Mm -hmm. exam and then the dog is going to be euthanized. So again, You think that I'm not caring about the dog's emotions. I am caring about whether the dog lives or dies. 
<laughs> no, and you're Ultimately. caring about the whole picture rather than just having this like anthropomorphic weird thing where yeah. we're like, oh, it's only the animal. It's like we see these people come in in tears. We see these people and we hear their pain and we like listen to their stories and drop off for board and trains first lessons for you. It's very emotional and people aren't coming because they're like, I want to use an e-collar because I'm an angry person. You're right. <laughs> right. And it's like very delicate and we really build relationships with our clients. And that's the beauty of why I think that we are so successful. So yeah. really these little comments don't bother me anymore. No, like they used to, because you just sound stupid. Yeah, it's just uh, to me the like recently I think why I've gotten more frustrated with seeing all of them is because like it's so glaringly clear just as like an overarching theme in society just like we talked about last time with Caesar that like nobody gives a fuck about the humans anymore. Mm -hmm. And it's it's so infuriating. And I look at those comments and I get frustrated because yes, they're attacking like my competency as a trainer which whatever i don't care about that but it like i know if my i don't want my clients yeah. reading that and thinking that like they're bad dog owners mm -hmm. because they're doing this this and this and it's like obviously they're going to be able to you know use their own reason and be like sure they're saying that but like my dog is super happy things are going great mm -hmm. this is really successful it's improving our life you know and they'll be able to to sort through that on their own but it's like i just don't want them to have to deal with that in the first place yeah like, it's yeah. just annoying i think it's good to speak on it for that instance like we're not speaking at it because we're trying to defend ourselves we're just trying to kind of defend our company in the stance that like we take as trainers and realize there's nothing wrong with balance training. No. And for you to like sit behind a computer and be like, I know best. Where are your, where are your videos? Yeah. Make a video, please. Yeah. I'm begging you guys to, to show me. <laughs> How you would handle these situations that we get. Like yes. we go through all the whole spectrum from puppies that are, have no issues yet. Maybe potty training and chewing is their biggest issue. Mm -hmm. And then we have dogs that have tried to kill people or other dogs that mm -hmm. are unsafe and need to be handled and need punishment. Yes. So that's reality. Yes, it is. Um, and that, <laughs> that one video you sent me, was it last night or this morning? Of that service dog. That, <laughs> that makes me think of this too. Yeah. Because again, it's like looking at things from like a very selfish mm -hmm. standpoint, I suppose. There was a, there was a video of, there's been like a mass, a mass influx of like owner trained service dogs. Mm -hmm. You can find them all over all over TikTok. Yeah. And I have my own opinions on like the whole service dog thing in general. I personally, when it comes to, if you get a dog and this, and this can still be argued that like, they're really just glorified emotional support animals mm -hmm. when you, when people get them for like their anxiety disorders and like stuff like that. I'm not discounting how terrible anxiety can be. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm, Simply saying that, I think that subjecting a dog to absorb all mm. of your mental health issues is just extremely unfair mm -hmm. to the animal. Yeah, <laughs> Dogs, because again, but I think it stems from the same way that people look at the dogs in our videos and anthropomorphize them mm. and make them human and make them this and that. Then you think you can use that dog as a way to work through your own human emotions. Mm -hmm. And dogs are not built for that. They don't have human emotions and they cannot help you with your human emotions. Yes. Can it be comforting to have a dog around? Sure, but it is unfair for them to be expected to like take on all of mm -hmm. your negativity and then be able to just like be fine from that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the, the video in particular I sent you, there was no, n nothing of significance no. that the dog was doing rather than she was feeding the, the dog and he was like paying attention to her and put her, his paws on her and she's like, he's helping me with my panic attack. Be like, she seemed very nervous. Yes. Filming yourself. Yeah, filming yourself. You're giving your dog treats during 
as it's performing yes. the task that it's supposed to be doing. It was just very like it's 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 a spectacle. Mm -hmm. It's like a fun way, I think, for people to get attention. Mm -hmm. And you know that like there was like a guy trying to talk to her or mm -hmm. something when all this is going on. And she's like, it's a class two misdemeanor to distract a service dog. Mm -hmm. And she's like yelling at him. And I'm like, is that helping your panic attack? Yeah. Is that helping you? Yeah. <laughs> like, it just doesn't, it doesn't make any sense to like, me. Service dogs are considered <clears throat> tools. Like they are yeah. considered like a very highly trained tool and they can help with multiple issues like seizure dogs and they have their time and place seeing eye dogs mm -hmm. but like to randomly just make your own dog a service dog i think is pretty unethical yes um to the people that actually do need to have dogs if they're having panic attacks or mm -hmm. things like that because they absolutely do make service dogs that help with people's oh, attacks yes. oh yeah 100 percent, and they're specifically trained for those types of things yes i think that it is very um it says a lot about a person that an average person who's not even a dog trainer can think so highly of themselves that they can take a random mutt from mm -hmm. the shelter and make it their own service dog mm -hmm. the people who train service dogs to the level that they need to be are using specifically bred and curated types of dogs that would be successful for that kind of work. And these are people that have specialized mm -hmm. for decades mm -hmm. in learning how to train these dogs, and the dogs to the capacity they yes, need to be. Are genetically lined up yeah. to perform these tasks and have the right temperament um, in order to do so. And it's very strict where a lot, like I think like, is it like one in nine puppies will actually make it to be chosen yeah. or something like that? Like, it's very much not as easy as it looks. No, it's not. And that's where it's like, guys, you're like dumbing this down to mm -hmm. a level where it really diminishes like the quality mm -hmm. and the pride that it takes to be able to like invest into that type of training and a program like that and things like that. And again, it's just because humans want to look at things from what they need and what they want mm. and all that kind of stuff. I mean, who's not, who's not caring about the dogs in that situation, yeah. guys. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. And like, I've said this before on the podcast, but like there's a whole website dedicated to finding out if a dog dies in a movie, like, and we can watch horrible, like graphic things happen to humans in movies. And we're like, sweet. I like this. You're right. And then the dog dies and we're like, Mic drop, slam the door, <laughs> go out of the theater. Like, yeah, it is pretty insane. And I get it because, like, I used to feel like that. Like, if the dog died, I'd be like, oh my God. And that would hurt. And I don't know why. Yeah. I can't, like, I can't really put my finger on why. I don't know if it's because we, like, we think view they're the so dog innocent. as more innocent, you know, mm -hmm. than anything else. But it's like, I mean, I suppose so. Like, Dogs don't really have malicious intents. You no, know? they so don't. So like they, sure, they are maybe a little bit more innocent. But I, I think that's also glaringly more obvious of like the value that we place on a dog's life mm. more than we place on like a human's life. Yeah, yeah. Um, Which is scary. It is. I think um, Joyful Canine Services sent me a video and um, I don't know if she sent you the same video. I don't think so. But it was like something like my dog barks and it's this whole movement. And she was like the reactivity movement. Yes. She was like, can you please talk about this? So, Jesse, we will <laughs> gladly talk about this. We're going to um, tap in. <laughs> we're going to start by saying no hate to anybody involved in this movement. You do you. Uh, but it's it is odd. silly. It's a little odd. It's a little silly. It's definitely okay to have a reactive dog and find groups of people that also have a reactive dog because it can feel very isolating and it can feel very lonely and terrible, but it's not okay to not do anything about it and just be like, oh, he almost killed another dog today, Toby, and like Life live in with a misery. reactive dog, yeah. hashtag. Yeah, <laughs> and like filming yourself like running at four in the morning away from another dog that your dog might see. It's like... 
It's fine if you have a reactive dog. There's nothing shameful about that. Mm -hmm. But it's shameful if you allow that behavior to build and build and build and your dog's dragging you down or dragging you toward other dogs. Like you have a societal, like, you you can't do that. Like, no, you can't do that. I think I remember she said she did send this to me a little bit ago. And I think I had talked about it on like my Instagram stories for like a, a portion. And I remember myself saying that like there's certain things in life that people should continue to be a little bit embarrassed about. Mm-hmm. A little bit of embarrassment when you have a reactive dog and yes. your dog is like a massive nuisance mm-hmm. in public is probably a little bit of a healthy feeling, okay? Because that should spur you on to be like, okay, this is not societally acceptable Mm -hmm. or safe to take a dog who is a nuisance out in public all the time and Mm -hmm. have it raging and everything like that. There's no shame, again. You shouldn't look at that and be like, oh, I'm terrible. But you should be in that position and be like, I can't have this happen again. Like, what can I do to solve this issue? Like, what can what steps can I take? Even if you're taking steps in, like, positive reinforcement only and that's what you want to do, mm-hmm. go for it. But to not it do anything might not and be work, like... But go for yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> to be like, yeah, my dog barks.com. Like... <laughs> well, what I think they're doing with it is they're spinning it away from... I need to take personal responsibility for this and help my dog be better into look at how good of a person I am because I put up with a dog that Mm. ruins my life. And it's like, like, hashtag God's plan. (laughs) And you're like, girl. Yeah. I saw another video the other day where I was like, why in the world? She, so she's like crying, sobbing, talking about how she's like, has anybody ever gotten a, had a reactive dog and then gotten a puppy and they just don't get along and I don't know what to do and I feel so bad because Mm -hmm. the puppy is just constantly getting like attacked aggressively by her other dog what the heck Mm -hmm. why did you get another dog like why in the world did you get another dog without confidently knowing how to like Mm -hmm. fix the issues that your first dog had And it's like very common that people are like, well, if I get a second dog, that will help offset some of my first dog's behavioral issues. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you right now, you're going to have two dogs with behavioral issues, (laughs) which is hard. Yeah, it's not going to work. And it won't work. This person that like does my dog bark, I didn't look into a lot of her videos, but I looked into like one or two. Mm -hmm. And she doesn't seem bothered by her dog's behavior. No. And if she's okay and somebody's truly not bothered and they can keep it their dog safe and managed well and you're like my dog barks you know i don't don't really care about that and it's not ruining your life by all means let your dog bark but when it becomes a nuisance to your neighborhood the kids in your neighborhood the other dogs in your neighborhood and you're allowing dangerous behaviors to be rehearsed over and over again you need to do something about it yeah well, and that's what I, unfortunately, that's what it appeared to be in some of the videos I watched mm-hmm. is that she takes the dog out and she just lets it bark at things yeah. as she's walking it around. And mm-hmm. she wants society to take away the stigma of having, of being around reactive dogs and recognize that this is just how dogs behave mm-hmm. More than she wants to try to actually change her dog's behavior. And it's like, if I'm not mistaken, it's a German Shepherd, which is a guarding breed by Mm -hmm. nature. So yes, like your dog is predisposed genetically to want to guard and protect. But if it constantly thinks that that's its job solely and you lose control, what if you lose control one day, it pulls you down, you lose your footing and it goes and attacks another dog. Mm -hmm. Then it's not so funny or so godly that you took this dog in yeah it's it's a slippery slope because i don't i don't know that i can think of any situation where barking just stayed barking Mm -hmm. no you know what i mean like reactivity doesn't just stay harmless Mm -hmm. i don't think there is a version of reactivity that's harmless no and it's either redirecting on the owner eventually because of all that pent up frustration mm-hmm. or eventually like redirecting on something else in their environment. Yeah. And it's just 
quite frankly, pretty sad when dogs are that upset and that reactive because they're having an emotional response. Mm -hmm. And it's like a toddler throwing a temper tantrum, which is very common, but it's like all the time, 24 seven. Anytime you leave the house, you know, your toddler is going to scream. Why is that enjoyable? No. Rather than trying to teach your child, this is how we behave in public and this is what society expects of you. Mm-hmm. And how can we all adhere to that and still have a happy life? Yeah. And um, we have, I took a video when we were walking around at this woman's apartment complex with the dog and stuff. And mind you, I didn't quite realize it until we were like halfway through the walk, but she was like, I literally haven't walked my dog in over a year mm-hmm. in this apartment complex. Like I've never been able to do it. And here we are mm-hmm. strolling along, passing yeah. all the dogs and doing all the things. And like, it's just appalling to me that like, and we had the e-collar on a hundred mm-hmm. and that's what we were correcting her for, for breaking her walking position. Um, I took like a six and a half minute long video And I think about halfway through, the dog gets one correction. Mm -hmm. She doesn't get any other corrections the whole time, despite dogs barking at her, passing other dogs, all that kind of stuff. And it's a correction at 100, and the dog has quite a reaction to it. And I... We're not, I don't want to take that out of the video. I don't mm. want to sugarcoat it for people. Mm. Like this is a situation where the dog needed to be corrected at a hundred. Mm-hmm. And sure, you might look at that and be like, oh, you definitely could have gotten away with a lower low. I, we're not playing around. Yeah. This is, this is a dog that again, this is a needs to happen, needs to be fixed immediately. Mm-hmm. We have to get this under control. Um, And again, this is not a dog who didn't understand the expectations. I'm not out here just correcting a dog at 100 who doesn't know how to walk on a leash. Yes. This dog has had over a year of positive reinforcement training, of learning all of his commands, all Mm -hmm. of his behaviors, all of his expectations. Chose. Oh, yeah. This dog knew exactly what it should have been doing, Mm -hmm. and she just didn't want to do it. Mm -hmm. She wanted to be reactive, and nobody had firmly told her that behavior mm-hmm. is off the table. We are not doing yes. that. So I always like tell owners, like, think of it like a math problem where if we can connect one behavior to one consequence, like X equals Y. Mm-hmm. And if X can always equal Y, then your dog understands that if I stop doing X, guess what? Why? I don't get why. <laughs> why doesn't happen anymore. Yes. And it's so easy. And it's like, correcting at 100 it's like a dirty word like 100 Mm. oh my gosh are you tom davis don't go above a six (laughs) like don't use the e-collar if you're gonna nag the shit out of your dog the whole time stop doing that like just do something else if you're gonna use it use it we were talking about this in our training meeting the other day how like we're not gonna mince words with you Mm -hmm. and our clients are not unaware of how we train and how we use the training tools. Like the e-collar works because it is aversive. Mm -hmm. Okay. It doesn't feel good. That is the truth. And Mm -hmm. that's why it is effective. The same way that getting a ticket and having to pay a hundred bucks when you speed doesn't feel good. Mm -mm. So we stop speeding. Mm -hmm. Touching a hot stove doesn't feel good. Mm -hmm. So I don't do it. That is just how life works in some capacities. We as humans, probably the most, well, I don't know what life is out there, but we are, you could assume the most evolved species on the planet, Mm -hmm. right? We still learn by very basic, primitive concepts. We are attracted to things that are pleasurable and we avoid things that cause discomfort. Survival. Yes. And, And you think that, as us being as highly evolved of a species as we are, and we still learn that way, that somehow a dog who is a much more primitive species doesn't also learn that way Mm -mm. at its most basic level. So that's just the, the reality of things is that we use these tools because they are aversive and we allow the dogs choices. Mm -hmm. You do X, you get Y, you do Z, you get whatever. Mm-hmm. So it's like that you you put the power in their court, which is what was interesting. 
And again, it's in the video. You can hear it come out of the owner's mouth herself. She says, <clears throat> my dog looks so much more relaxed when I'm using the e-collar. Mm -hmm. Again, this is a dog we're correcting at 100, okay, for these things. She said, my dog looks so much more relaxed on this walk than she ever looked this last year when we were doing positive only and force free mm -hmm. methods. And you can, exactly, because she's less frustrated, she's less confused, she's less micromanaged, and she finally, the power is in her court and she can decide, I know exactly what happens if I perform behavior A, and I know exactly what happens if I perform behavior B, mm -hmm. and I get to choose. And that's fair. Like, and people are always like, oh, it's going to hurt your relationship with your dog, and they're never going to be the same. I haven't seen that happen. I've only mm -hmm. seen e-callers better dog's life because of the other training we put into place. It's not all about punishment all the time where we're hitting 100. There's beautiful moments sprinkled in many, many of our sessions. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, a camera isn't there to see all of those. So you see... Yeah what's going to do well online? You see interest in content. So it's really easy to pick apart like another trainer's work and be like, mm -hmm. that sucks. Your timing was bad. And if you think that the trainers that are truly having really good success with their clients with severe behavioral issues and things like that aren't doing firm, harsh corrections when necessary, you're, you're, you're jaded. You're mm -hmm. lying to yourself. Because they're just not showing you. Wake up, America. We're just, <laughs> wake up. We're just showing you. Mm -hmm. Like, we don't have anything to hide. We're mm -hmm. going to tell you exactly how we got the results that we got because we want other people to be able to have the same success that we do. And we th I, think, I think David even said this in one of his last podcasts where he was like, sometimes I feel like we're like the lone ranger out mm -hmm. here still preaching that like, other than like Jeff Gelman, mm -hmm. I think, you know, that like corrections are necessary and like extremely important and it's okay to like firmly correct the dog. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what does Jeff say? Like make it suck mm -hmm. <laughs> or something and like that. He's like a true inspiration in how he handles things and he's gotten death threats and he like keeps on swimming. He d mm -hmm. doesn't know skin off of his back because he knows he's not giving a bad message yep. and he knows he's being realistic and he knows his training works. Yep. I mean, so. there were times I remember when he was doing seminars, he was traveling around. There were like groups of like people that would meet at like the airports where mm -hmm. he would land and protest mm -hmm. and like they would show up to places that his seminars were like, just ridiculous, mm -hmm. ridiculous things. And it's like, sorry that he's helping dogs yeah. and people. Sorry that he now, like, I think he lives in Greece, living his best life, yeah, right. doing like <laughs> online work, like gets to go to the beach every day and has his dogs playing in the water. It must suck. Yeah, you know? right. It must really suck. You really did something by showing up at the <laughs> airport. <laughs> oh my gosh. But yeah, it's like, I sometimes I kind of feel the same where it's like, you see all these trainers that you know behind the scenes, they are doing all of the same stuff mm -hmm. that we are, yet they just don't want to talk about it yes. and they don't want to say it and they don't want to put it on the internet and they don't want to deal with the backlash. And it's like, that's the road that we take, guys, mm -hmm. to where we no longer have access to being able to use the training mm -hmm. tools that we want to use with yes. dogs. And I had a client recently and there's a very famous, like, you're going to know who it is when I say it's in Pittsburgh. Very famous, very famous online for a long time. Um, and one of my clients went to him and she said that the amount of prong collar corrections she had to do were insane. And her arms were getting tired and there were very harsh corrections. Yeah. And she was like, I don't feel right applying this much pressure to my dog's neck all the time. And there was no e-collar option. He just. Really? Yeah. He just didn't use e-collars out much hmm. or specifically in her case so when we introduced e-collar to her she understood it and um i think another trainer was telling her to like tap the e-collar until the dog looks at you and just all this convoluted shit yeah so when she came to our program she's like you gave me my walks back yeah like you or she's enjoying her life with her dog now yeah and and like to expand on like that prong collar situation 
Because, like, I'm all for a good prong collar correction. Mm -hmm. It can be extremely impactful with certain dogs. But in her case, it clearly, the dog did not find it aversive. Mm -mm. If you're having, and that's a key point to this, is, like, um, again, like I said, with that dog that I'm correcting at 100, I'm not correcting at 100 every five steps on Mm -hmm. this walk. OK, I'm the, the correction is set very high so that is very meaningful so that the amount of times I have to correct you should be almost non-existent. Yes. OK, so I want to be able to set my boundaries, make them very clear so that we don't have to keep having that conversation again. If you find yourself correcting your dog, whether it's with an e-collar, the whether it's a prong, walk, whether it's yeah. whatever, over and over and over and over and over again, there's two things you need to look at. Am I, is my correction actually motivating? Mm -hmm. Does my dog actually care about it? And I'll say something maybe unpopular, just because a dog vocalizes from a correction doesn't mean it actually was impactful to them if they continue to perform the behavior afterwards. Ever met a German shepherd? (laughs) Or a Shiba Inu or a beagle? Yeah, a beagle. (laughs) Uh, Vocalizations hardly correlate to an actual pain response. Yes. I'll leave it at that. The other, the other thing that you need to look at is, does your dog actually understand what you are correcting for and know what the clear alternative is in order to not receive a correction? Mm. Okay. So there has to be, both of those two factors have to be considered if you are nagging your dog. If it feels like you're nagging your dog, those are the mm. two things you need to look at. Yes. Is the criteria clear? Meaning, say you're, um, we'll look at this from two perspectives. We'll look at it from nuisance behaviors. So if I am having to repeatedly correct my dog for jumping on people, okay? Um, One thing I need to look at is, am I actually being very consistent in correcting them every time they jump on people? Mm -hmm. Or am I being a little loosey-goosey where I'm like, well... If it's, if it's your dad, it's okay. Mm-hmm. Or, oh, I know grandpa. that you, if it's grandpa, if it's these people, if it's those people, it's okay. And we're not correcting you. But then all of a sudden, if it's a stranger, we are, or if it's mm-hmm. grandma, we are, or whatever. That's just unfair. Yeah. It doesn't make any sense to the dog. Right. So that's part of the math problem. X isn't always equaling Y. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so and it doesn't like, make sense. They're like, wait, X doesn't always equal Y? Sometimes y, X equals B. And yes. that gets confusing. And then C, and then D, mm-hmm. and then the dog is like, what do you want from me? And the people are like, oh, I just feel so bad correcting. <laughs> and you're like, you should feel bad for how you're confusing your dog. Yes, yes. Worry more about confusing the dog. So if that is the case, then I need to look at this and be like, okay, I need to be more consistent about correcting my dog 100% of the time or very close to it for the jumping. If you're like, no, but I am, I am correcting them for jumping every single time they jump. Well, then the level you're correcting them at Mm -hmm. is not high enough Mm -hmm. and you need to go higher or you need to find a different type of aversive that will be Mm -hmm. a little bit more effective. The, the dog's behavior in the moment of the correction does not indicate to you whether the punishment was effective. What lets you know when the punishment is effective is how they behave moving forward afterwards Mm -hmm. okay because there's plenty of dogs that you will correct them they'll vocalize and they'll stop the jumping but then as soon as somebody else walks in the door they do it again Mm -hmm. so that tells me the correction i gave them in that moment they didn't care about it wasn't motivating enough they decided it wasn't an actual punishment because it didn't decrease the behavior presenting Mm -hmm. itself it's psychology like it has to be motivating enough for the behavior to stop. Mm-hmm. And then now let's look at it. So that's the nuisance behavior side of it. Now let's troubleshoot like an obedience command. So the difference is that with nuisance behaviors, you're trying to get rid of eradicate. a behavior. You're trying to eradicate something. With a obedience command, we're asking the dog to perform a behavior. And then if you're at the point where you're correcting with an e-collar for it, you're correcting for non-compliance of the command and the expectations that come with it. If we'll do a sit, for instance, your dog is consistently breaking their sit command over and over again, and you feel like you're correcting them for it all the time. We need to analyze, does your dog actually know 
Mm-hmm. The expectations that you have with the sit. Can they verbally respond to the word sit and be able to do it consistently? Mm-hmm. Um, do they understand that they are supposed to hold that sit command until they are given a release word? What is your expectation for the duration of it? Have you tried to generalize it around distractions? You know, all those different things. You have to do your due diligence with that kind of thing. And then if you're like, yeah, I'm very confident. They know the command. They know the expectations. Okay, well then our uh, yet again, our correction for the non-compliance is just not effective enough. Mm-hmm. It's not motivating enough. So what it comes down to is their desire to do something else in that moment that does not comply with holding their sit overpowers and outweighs the consequence of getting the correction. Yes. Yeah. And it has to happen. Like when people are like even with sit or obedience commands, if sometimes you're correcting for it, but then grandma comes through the door and all goes out the window because grandma's mm-hmm. so exciting and you just, you're going to allow that because it's so exciting. Yep. If you're not challenging or training your dogs in the moments that they're super excited in a really, really happy pumped up way, mm-hmm. you are not going to have any control when your dog is displaying a behavior that is not happy or scared or they run into the street because you keep allowing them to kind of push the boundaries. Yeah. Your dogs, dogs aren't in the same way. They're not very good at, um, they're, they don't understand the gray areas. No, you know, they don't understand why in some aspects they're allowed to break the rules and then why in some aspects they wouldn't be allowed. So, Mm. Um, I agree. You're losing rapport with them. Mm -hmm. Every time you allow them to skirt by on the rules, they're getting more and more to the areas where they're going to push the limits in every Mm -hmm. other aspect as well. Yeah. And then your relationship, like they don't trust your ability to do anything anymore. No. Because they start losing respect for you. Yes. Oh, thanks, Paige. (laughs) <laughs> we're getting notes from uh the set from Hold our on. producer <laughs> hello the producers checked it well we didn't do an introduction so uh thanks for jumping right in with us today guys we thanks. we came in hot we came in serious mm-hmm. we came in me myself at least slightly frustrated so i feel better after this i feel better mm-hmm. after talking it out yes yes Taking some deep breaths, drinking <sighs> some ice water, calming my vagus nerve. Yes. Yes, yes. I can't wait to see what people have to say about... All I have to say back to that, love you. Mm-hmm. Thanks for the engagement. Yes. It just gets our uh, content out to the people who actually truly need it. Yes. And need help immediately. And not to, you know, coddle and yes. baby their dogs along the way. And I love this job. And I love what I do mm-hmm. because I know that ultimately what I do is working and improving and giving a gift to people. Mm-hmm. If I'm going to mm-hmm. toot my own horn, toot toot, um, I do help people. We do help people. You do help people, Bridget. I see it every day. Thank Your clients you. love you. Yes. You're very good at what you do. Thank you. So are you. Oh. And so is Senny. Yeah. Hi, Senny. One day we'll convince her. Yes, Sunny is our assistant right trainer, um, and she does a lot of behind-the-scenes work with our board and trains. She does a phenomenal job, but she's just not ready at this point to be on the podcast. It's okay. Not to our standards. Yes. She herself has decided mm-hmm. that she is not ready for it. Yes. I think she'd kill it, yes. personally. But, you know, we'll see. We'll see. We're working on her. Um, anyways, thanks for hanging out, guys. Thanks. Much love. Happy training.